We're in the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'm Yorick Wilkes, and I'm here with Professor Martin Kay, who's Professor of Linguistics at Stanford University and a long-time researcher, research fellow at Xerox Palo Alto. Uh, we're here to talk about his life and work. He has, in my view, been one of the most creative, one or two people, if not the most, in the whole history of computational linguistics, and it's a huge privilege to have him here today and to tell us about the genesis of his work over a considerable number of years. And he's still, of course, extremely research active and active in the field, as we shall come to that as the president of ICCL, the International Committee on Computational Linguistics. So, Martin, um, very good that you've come. Thank you. Um, I mean, can we sort of go back to what the French would call your formation? I mean, in the sense that, where would you like to start? I know you have war memories, but we don't have to go to those. No, which... Let's not do that. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I didn't think they'd go very far. <laughs> um, but you were at Cambridge, of course, and when you were there, I was there after you and met the same people. You met and were influenced by very remarkable people like Margaret Masterman, mm -hmm. the Cambridge Language Research Unit. I mean, do you, do you have interesting, you probably do, memories of those days? Oh, I could talk for as much time as we have about those days. I mean, Margaret Masterman was a perfectly remarkable person whom I don't understand at all, having spent two years in very close proximity with her. But she had a reputation of being able to see something in improbable people. And I was an improbable person in whom she apparently saw something. And um, I profited enormously from that. I also got a little bit mixed up in some of her religious things and so forth, which uh, to one extent or another I regretted at one time or another, but she set me on a road which I would certainly never have followed otherwise. Well, she had the same effect on me, and one of the first jobs I remember when working for her was to review a paper you'd written with her on mechanical pigeon translation, oh dear, yes. which I think somehow never had the... Reclam it should have done, but it actually was a very remarkable paper, or would you now completely dismiss it as a jeu d'esprit on your part? Or No, no, I think it was, I still think it was a good idea. I mean, I think the basic idea was this. Um, machine translation is very difficult. Um, to do by machine what human translators do is almost unthinkably difficult. But maybe we could do other things that would be useful. Nowadays, we are translating web pages for people statistically, and that is proving to be very useful. But the idea there was that one should um, find a language, an artificial language, which is a subset of a real language that people would be able to understand, um, but that would preserve ambiguities as much as possible, not try to solve them, try to somehow give the reader or the hearer, or the recipient of this message, the material that they would need to do what people do best, namely to construct a meaning out of these suggestions that the text gives them. I think it was a good idea. I think it could still be pursued. Do you think it had the same motivation as what has now come back to us as controlled language, or were primitives in some ways different from that, or do you think they're all different versions of the same thing? Well, to some extent, there's certainly versions of the same thing. Controlled language, this was... This idea was that one tried to control the output in order to make it as tolerant of ambiguity as possible, preserving of ambiguity as much as possible. Controlled language is, in a sense, the obverse of that, where you try to force the person producing the original text to make exactly clear what they want to say so that you won't have the difficulties translating that people normally have. Of course, you're right. I mean, the motives are quite different, of course. So you, you, you left Cambridge and went to America, where you've, in some sense, been ever since, mm -hmm. with trips back to us. I mean, I remember you went to join Dave Hayes in the RAN Corporation in Santa Monica. I remember that's where I first saw you. I think you were on the top floor of the RAN Corporation, which had a special elevator. I mean, what are your memories of Dave Hayes and the RAN Corporation? Dave Hayes was in a, in a totally different way a remarkable person just like Margaret Masterman was. David Hayes invented the term computational linguistics. There were a couple of contending terms. One of them was mechanolinguistics, and I'm sure we're glad that that one didn't make it. Another one was the term that we actually used at the RAND Corporation. That was automatic language data processing. That didn't make it either. Um, but he, he 
saw that after um, machine translation was rather badly treated, he thought, by um, the by a, a blue ribbon committee that the the U.S. government drew up. Um, what that committee said was, we really ought to have a much more solid scientific basis. Um, in order to provide that scientific basis, by golly, the first thing we had to have was a name. And so right before my very eyes and in his office, he came up with this name Computational Linguistics. But he also founded the Association for Computational Linguistics. It was then called the Association for Machine Translation and Computational Linguistics. Um, he also founded the ICCL, the International Committee on Computational Linguistics, and the Coaling meetings that followed from that. It's a huge amount of stuff that um, um, they're not particular contributions to the scientific substance of our field, but the infrastructure and so forth, a huge amount of that was provided by him. He was somebody, I think, who had lots of insecurities, um, which, as usual, surfaced in a great sense of security. I mean, he seemed to be extremely well poised on all occasions. Um, but again, like Margaret, he gave me an opportunity which I badly needed. Um, perhaps I could tell a little story Please. about... He, um, after I had been at RAND for two or three years, he had a choice between two things, both of which he wanted to do. One of which was to accept an invitation to visit Japan, which he had never been to and wanted very much to visit and to meet people working there in machine translation and such. And the other was to give a speech to the RAND Board of Trustees, which once in a while a project would have the privilege of doing. And he thought about this for a while and decided to go to Japan, which left me to talk to the Rand Board of Trustees. Now, that was, of course, a privilege and so forth, but for me it was a turning point. Because up until that point, I had been very diffident about talking to audiences and uh, and presenting my ideas and so forth, that changed, I must say, in retrospect, changed everything for me. Rand was very careful to make these presentations in such a way that they would come off well. And they had a man called Ivan Lowe, who was an old movie producer from the silent days. And he produced any production that was going to be put before the Board of Trustees. It wasn't allowed to just happen. And I remember saying to Dave before he left and went to Japan, it's no good. I can't give a presentation to a huge room with nobody in it but one, but somebody who's just listening to criticize what I'm doing. And I remember Dave, who'd been through this experience before, saying to me, believe me, Ivan fills the room. And he did. <laughs> He also presumably was someone who made the transition from silent movies to talkies, so I mean, <laughs> like many. Yeah. My memory of Dave was initially Rand being rather military as a sort of shaven-headed military officer type, and right at the end, in his old age, he, he became a sort of long-haired prophet, didn't he? Addicted yes. to dance and things. Yes, he went to... There was a, there was a period through, during which he went to the New York City Ballet every night. I'm not quite sure how he afforded to do that. Um, and I have no idea what it was that he thought he was getting out of it. It's altogether at variance with everything that I know about Dave, and I can't explain any of it to you. He was the first person to say in my hearing, and this is a very, very long time ago, in the 70s, I suppose, that publishing would become a personal matter, and that oh. you, one would publish one's own work, oneself, off one's computer. And I remember him saying that when there weren't personal computers, so... He was just miles ahead of his time and knew exactly what he was doing, but it, it sounded futuristic, I mean... Yes, well, he did, he had one or two, well, more than one or two, lots of things, actually, of that kind. I got involved with him for a while on a project um, which was brought to his mind when he discovered that the National Cash Register Corporation 
was producing something called ultra microfiche. I think most of us know what microfiche were. These were put a single page on a much, much smaller um, piece of, 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 the, of the material so that you could get whatever it was. I don't remember, maybe 100, maybe 200 or something on one, one relatively small sheet. So he computed, we computed, I worked with him on this, that um, for a modest sum of money, um, we could put together a library of a million books and could make enough copies of this so that all the countries of the third world could have a library of a million books or maybe more than one library of a million books. And it would be to start with a standard library. They would all get the same thing, but they would all have it. And um, Dave pushed this idea. He thought that this was something that America could do for the world as a whole that would be positive in just about every way. I am told that the idea made it as far as President Johnson's desk, but President Johnson decided that this was an idea that, after all, he was not going to have. And Google sort of have had it much, much later. Google have had it. Fascinating. Google have had it. But, but there, the, the problem I had with the million books thing was I could imagine that in many places in the world, these things would be accepted with great thankfulness, but that little by little, these cards would get lost and mm. they would go out of the window and they would wind up in the, in the men's room and, and who would know what. But after a year... Um, there wouldn't be anywhere near a million books anymore. But Google have it set up so that you can do what you like with them and they'll still be there. Absolutely. We're in the late 60s, I think, now. or we That's Rand, I think, or the 60s, the mid yeah. to the late. Yeah. And, and the work of yours that I first sort of came across and after the Pigeon Translation, where I was just a doc, postdoc, but was the your morphology for English. I mean, the, the, the line as I remember it at the time, was that you had produced one of the very first complete morpholo computational morphologies for English. I mean, is that your memory? I mean, was that a task you gave yourself or one that Rand thought up? Well, I think, I think we've got the timing on this wrong. Uh, I was interested in methods for dealing with morphology, but the work that I did on morphology for English was actually done after I'd left Rand and got to Xerox. I worked on it with a, with a graduate student of mine, Hedar Shemtov. Um, and it, uh, I was interested partly because, although English is famous for being a morphologically rather dull language, it has almost no inflectional morphology left. Its derivational morphology mm. is as complex as anybody's. Mm -hmm. And um, I got involved in that not because of any burning interest in English morphology. It was an exercise in learning to use Unix utilities. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, how much can I learn about words just by applying Unix utilities in one way or another to lists of them? And the answer turned out to be, well, an awful lot. And probably three quarters of what wound up in that dictionary was just simply that. After that, after that, then there had to be a lot of careful editing and so forth. Um, I believe that you will still find traces of that in uh, today's power set stuff and so mm. on, but I'm actually not sure. Want to get to power set, but that can yes. Yeah. But, <laughs> that's a, uh, no, yes, that's to come, I'm sure. But yeah. okay, so I understand. I'm sorry, I got the dates of the, the morphology wrong. Um, but let's move on to sort of one of your first big sort of gigantic pillars of your career and contribution. I mean, chart parsing. I mean, I think that's one of the two or three things that people associate with you inevitably. Um, uh, there may be people watching this who don't quite know what chart parsing is, but I mean, in some sense, is it correct to say it was um, both a parsing methodology, but also a data structure for storing intermediate parses in a way that hadn't been done before? How would you mm. describe it? I mean, is that yeah. wrong? Well, no, I think that's right. Um, I think the key work had been done by a couple of other people that everybody perfectly correctly cites, namely, well... Um, one, of, one of the people is a, actually a group of three people, Kasami and Younger. Um, they produced, well, Koch, I think, was the first person to produce this very famous algorithm. 
And it was one of the things that got me really hooked in computational linguistics. I think it's fair to say it was the first algorithm that was designed purely to meet a need that came from natural as opposed to artificial language. It wasn't something that you would use in a compiler compiler. It's something that you needed for a language like English. So that was, to me, a huge inspiration. I thought, this, this, it's got to be possible to do more of this kind of thing and get more mileage out of it. And, and I suppose I spent quite a lot of, what I, of the time that I've spent on this kind of thing motivated by that sort of thing. The other one was the algorithm 10 years later by Jay Early. But what seemed to me, what, what happened to turn that into chart parsing was not really a, all that big a step. It was to see that what is important here is actually not the algorithm. It's not the sequence of events. The key idea is in the data structures. <laughs> and that um, if you try to pare away as much as possible of the algorithm, you are left with something much more powerful than you had to start with. I mean, basically the idea is that you have this sort of universe of active and inactive elements which live in this chart where they connect at certain places. And um, in order to make sure that you have done everything that you have to do by the end of the day, you don't carefully nest a loop inside another loop or a recursion inside another recursion. You just make sure that all the actives and inactives that have to meet get to meet and that they interact in the way that they interact. That was all you have to bother about. Which means that you have a lot of flexibility to, um, to interact with such a system in completely other ways. So for example, if you have some reason to think that this phrase is more likely, is a more likely member of a correct solution than this one, you can say, well, let us do that one first. And if we wind up with a solution that we like or that is, seems more probable, then we can say, okay, let's stop now. We'll, we think we've got enough, enough material and so we can stop. Um, with these previous algorithms, you had to wait, things were done in, an, in lockstep in a certain way, and you just had to wait until the end. Somewhere about that time, was that the time when you wrote something I remember well and was, I thought, very important at the time, about a sense of equivalence between top-down and bottom-up parsing? I mean, some people have seen those as completely different strategies, and they were taught in elementary classes when there were elementary classes on computational linguistics. But I, I think I remember at that time you made a... You wrote a paper where you said, that, well, there's just two ways of looking at the same thing. And you could just see it, as I remember, it's a long time and I haven't reread it, as, as it were, two ways of creating fundamentally the same data structure. I mean, was this at the chart parsing period, in which case, as that was data, a data structure, that would be natural? Yes. I mean, that one could, one could embed these two in the same framework in such a way that the differences between them would be very small. That was indeed part of it. But... The, but that, of course, is something that Jay Early had, al had already done. The Jay, it's been interesting to me recently. I've heard, been to meetings where I've heard people say, oh, but the, uh, the early algorithm, it's really top down. And somebody else in a different meeting will say, oh, yes, that's OK, all very well. But the Jay Early algorithm, that, of course, is bottom up. And indeed, it's both. Mm. And um, it's, so it's what they call, it's bottom up, but it uses top-down filtering. Um, and, you know, never mind what that means, but that, that, that is an idea which embeds itself completely naturally in, in, in charts and chart parsing and so forth. You can just tweak the parameters and you get a little bit more top-down or a little bit more bottom-up. Mm. That's what I remember taking away, and that was an insight yeah. I'd never have thought of unless I'd read it there. Let's maybe move on to the other major development that people associate with you, and of course quite separate from chart parsing, which is of course unifi unification grammar, and that of course has spawned a, uh, a range of initial systems with different initials, but all with Argean as it were, not to be confused with universal grammar of course. I mean, um, in reading your ACL Lifetime Achievement Lecture again, um, I realized, which I hadn't spotted before, that the genesis of that was connected, in your mind as I understood it, but correct me, with what had happened in the experience of ATNs and registers. Was that right? Yeah, it is right. Um, <clears throat> one of the th things that occurred 
to me twice, both this and something else that occurred later, is that I find, found that I was fighting against the natural tendency to try and describe language from a language speaker's point of view, which you notice linguist essentially always does. The whole Chomsky tradition is seeing language from the speaker's point of view. And my desire to be able to analyze bits of language that come from somewhere that I have no control over, in other words, from the hearer's point of view. And so it seemed to me that if what people know about their language is a grammar, whatever that may be, then this ought to be something that you can apply in either direction. So reversibility has been something that has always interested me. Well, um, there were lots of proposals for the speaker's point of view. Um, uh, ATNs, Augmented Transition Networks, Bill Woods, um, were something designed from the hearer's point of view. This was a parser, but unfortunately this couldn't be reversed to work the other way either. So, so it seemed as though you, if you had to imagine that speakers learn one grammar and hearers learn another grammar, and as far as we can tell, it's sort of by chance that they wind up being able to talk to one another. Um, now, um, I worked on this, as I did on many things, with Ron Kaplan, and he and I were both, both concerned about these problems with ATNs. He had actually written the largest grammar at the time in that, in that formalism. Um, and what struck us was, well, first of all, I should say, ATNs had this notion of a register. And a register is an idea that you find all over computation. It's a place where you can put a value. And as the computation goes on, you may replace the value with another value and so forth. It's a variable in your favorite programming language. Um, what occurred to us was the key thing about ATNs was that if you, if you fixed it so that once a register had a value, you could make that value more specific. That's to say, if it contained a structure, you could add more pieces to the structure. But you couldn't ever replace any part of that structure by something different. So once a register had contents, it had them always. So Ron Kaplan used to call this the same predicate. So you were allowed to say these two things were the same, but you weren't allowed to replace one by the other. This game gave rise to, um, to uh, in a few steps from there, that's the key idea. A few steps takes you to the idea of unification. Now, unification, I didn't realize at the time, was a word that was also already being applied in computer science. It was, it was the, one of the two key ideas in logic programming. Um, now, their view of it was slightly different from ours, um, or from mine at any rate. You see, one of the ideas, one of the points about my idea was this. The contents of a register consisted of a set of attributes, each one of which had an associated variable. Um, I mean, so had an associated value, which may indeed have been a variable. Um, but these things together constituted a description of something, a description of a word in a sentence, or a phrase in a sentence, or whatever. Um, and you could always add more information to a description. You could always add new things. So there was no sense of there being um, a complete description. You could always find new attributes that would had, have new values. This was not the notion that was used in um, logic programming. And interestingly enough, it's not the, the notion that is used today in some of the more modern um, unification-based um, formalisms and linguistics. But that idea I had to sort out in my mind in order to decide whether I could even allow myself to use the word unification, which it seemed somebody else had preempted and I would have to go off looking for something else. But I decided it was OK. It was close enough for government work. Mm. Nice. Of course, uh, you reminded me that, I mean, the thing that many people in the business forget is that Colmar OAR came up with 
prologue to do machine translation. It's often thought it arose to do, I don't know, timetabling for classes or something, but right. it's rubbish. It arose to do machine translation. So in a sense, with, with more luck or genius, I mean, he could also have made that stab. He, he in inventing prologue for a linguistic task, yeah. he could have seen that, the, the more general notion of unification, uh, uh, sorry, a, a notion of unification different from the one he was using would yeah. have sort of had more traction on language. Is that fair? No, I, I'm I not don't trying to put him down. I'm, I'm just trying to get a comparison between what you were doing and what he was no, doing. No, I don't think this, I don't think either would have any more traction. I think I didn't know about his. If no. I had, I would almost certainly have gone with it and not mm. tried to find anything else. Um, no, I think, um, and indeed, a lot of the stuff that I have actually done when experimenting with stuff like this, I, I use prologue. I mean, I, hmm. I forget. The, f the fact is that I'm only going to come up with a certain number of attributes. They don't come falling out of the sky or something. So, um, so I really didn't need this, no. this notion. How much is what you've just said? I mean, I've not thought this through in asking it. How much is what you've just said about the use of unification Without saying it, I mean, it's basically to do syntactic parsing, but also, of course, you can unify over semantic predicates or anything as well. I mean, how much is that specifically about syntactic parsing? The reason I ask that is, I mean, I've been looking recently with colleagues at the idea of using essentially a revamped form of ATMs, not for doing syntactic parsing, but for controlling dialogue. Now, if you do that, and I mean, hey, I mean, Eliza, in some sense, had something very like an ATM, but without the registers. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to bring out is about the function of the registers. What you said about the function of the registers seemed to me in ATNs to apply specifically to syntax, and particularly this rule of you can't really overwrite the contents. And it seems to me that constraint may only apply to something about syntactic parsing. It's not fair to ask this on the fly, I know that. But if you were <laughs> using something like an ATN to control the structure of a dialogue as it proceeded, I mean, things might change radically in a whole dialogue if a register controlled any yeah. arbitrary attribute, like, um, you know, is the person listening to me or not? I'm joking. But, I mean... Um, I, can, I can imagine that you would... You could get a lot... I haven't thought this through, but I could imagine you could get a lot of mileage out of a system where you could change the values of registers. But I think there would be nothing left of the notion of unification. I mean, you would yeah. have to... You would have to rethink what your what your priorities were. Um, unification is a, is, a, is a fairly strict framework yeah. within, to work within, and that's, uh, uh, and so you, I mean, you know when you are computing it right and when you are not. And that's well, precisely, I mean, that's where you differ from ATNs, isn't it? I mean, an ATN register, you know, the, part of the glory of ATNs was they were sort of arbitrary structures. You could do anything. They were Turing machines with registers. Um, uh, you, by constraining it, with these sort of rules on what could be rewritten register. I mean, that's what made it more interesting, wasn't it? I mean, you, you, they were a set of constraints, essentially, that made the whole form as a much more interesting. And, and ATNs weren't going anywhere as they were, were they? I mean, they'd come to the end of their natural lifespan. They, I, yes, I think that's true. Yeah, um, um, they, the unification did give us a handle on what I was most interested in, namely this question of reversibility. That's right, precisely. And that was, uh, and as we know from all over computing, um, in general, computations are not reversible. I mean, this, yeah. it's uh, only unusual ones that happen to fit in these little boxes that we make for them that turn out to be reversible. And I wanted something like that. Do you, do you have? You made the nice point about how lucky that speakers and hearers, as it were who happen to be the same people usually, um, have access by assumption to the same grammar. But I mean, I've never had any strong feeling about what psychology tells us. Not that we're either of us psychologists and we're merely speaking off the record. But I mean, what does your hunch tell you? Does your hunch tell you that speakers and hearers are using the same grammar and reversing it? Or does it tell you, as some say, that they may be quite different mechanisms in the brain? I mean, I, I have no strong views myself. I wonder where your hunch leads you, or it's not something you feel the need to talk about? Well, it, it's of course complicated, and I, have, I don't have a hunch about whether the same mechanisms are being used. It seems to me that they must be using, in, to a large extent, the same grammar, because let's face it, in the end, that's what it means to say that they're talking the same language. Um, it doesn't mean that 
you can't, that you might not say to me something which I understand perfectly well, but which I would never quite say that way. I mean, I have to be much more permissive in the grammar that I apply, that I ap apply as a hearer than I do completely unconsciously in the grammar that I use as a speaker. But they have to, those two grammars have to have a huge amount in common. I'm taking the word grammar very, very broadly mm. now. But mm. They must do, although, of course, we all know both in our own language and with other languages. You just said it yourself. I mean, we have the ability to snatch stuff out of things that are said to us and get something like a meaning. But as you say, those sentences are something we might not have the competence to produce. I mean, only skill speakers produce some very well formed. We kinds might of not sentences. have the skill to produce, or we might have the skill to produce better or differently mm. or I mean uh, we can understand people perfectly well who speak who are foreigners and who speak a, a very garbled mm. version of English cool. I mean as well of course nothing follows from that I mean you're absolutely right. right I mean it's just anecdotal observations could, could we drift back to machine translation because machine translation sort of weaves in and out of the conversation and I don't think that's surprising I mean you've devoted a lot of thought to it and I, I think I still believe that you know, machine translation remains the, the ur task of computational linguistics, and it never really goes away. Um, one of your major papers, as I remember, was about the relation of MT to machine-aided translation. And I think, if I remember rightly, I haven't reread it for this interview, but my memory of what you were saying was that, well, MT might never really succeed, and you should make the best of machine-aided machine translation and somehow elevate that to a, 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 a proper skill, particularly when combined with office tools and machines of the kind we have. I wonder if you still hold that view, or does the, the spread of easily available free MT on the web change your view? I mean, how do you stand on that now? No, my view on that hasn't changed at all. I think one of the things that's happened with MT on the web is not so much that we have seen huge improvements in what we can do in MT, but we've actually redefined what we mean translation to be. You can now click on something that says, translate this page, and you get something with a lot of English words in it, and a lot of the time you can understand that, and you're grateful to have it, but your attitude towards it is the attitude that you have towards everything you get from the web. The, the, one of the most amazing things about the web is you don't feel as though it owes you anything. You're always lucky to get what you get. And, if, and you don't go away and decide never to go to the web again if you happen to lose out on a couple of queries. And your attitude to translation is the same thing. You translate this page, you get something you don't understand, and you say, well, too bad, better luck next time. No, but people have built these systems based on, for example, um, European Parliament transcriptions. Nobody, nobody is seriously proposing using the translation systems that are being produced today or anything like them for actually doing those translations. Like most of the translations that are really needed in the world, they have to be done really carefully by people who really know what they're doing so as to make sure that the intentions of the original speaker really are preserved. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there's more of this translation needed all the time. Companies, globalization, spreading themselves across the world, the European Parliament that requires that many of the texts that produce the so-called so-called authentic, that's to say, legally speaking, they have the, the translations have the same legal status as the original. All of these things mean that high quality translation is needed all the time. So one thing that we could do, as I argued in 1985, and I'm still prepared to argue today, is to ask ourselves the question, how can we reduce the cost of producing high quality machine trans I'm sorry, high quality translation. And um, it seems to me that the answer for a long time has to be the final arbiter, the person, the, the control of this process has to be in the hands of human beings. How can we provide them with 
the tools that they need. By the way, we've done a good deal of that. A lot of translators work with translation memories and, and stuff of this sort. But there are lots of other things to be explored. And what I argued in 1985 was that one of those things should be a system where the machine produces the translation but can have access to one or perhaps more than one human collaborator to whom it can pose questions. Does this word mean that? Does it mean this? Does this pronoun refer to that? Does it refer to some other thing? Um, possibly a collaborator who knows only the text of the original and doesn't know anything about, uh, about the language that's being translated into all sorts of different ways that one could imagine trading these things off against one another. And basically none of that has been explored, as far as I can tell. No. I, I, I'm sure European Commission officials won't be watching this video, but of course they will be intrigued at your view that nothing that's derived from those Euro Parliament uh, multilingual corpora will do the job for them, because, because they've been putting millions and millions of euros into several projects whose names we know in exactly the expectation that's the case, but they may be deceiving themselves now. I'm sure you may be right about that. Yes, yes. Um, so for you then, this whole thing hasn't shifted very much. The web has not changed everything utterly. It's just provided us stuff with free, and we've moved the goalposts on what we accept. We've learned to use bad translation or make the best of it. Absolutely, and there are lots of extremely good... Somebody, I think it was Ken Church, wrote a paper with a title something like how how to do good things with bad translations or something. That wasn't the title, but it was mm -hmm. a title that means basically that. And there are lots and lots of good things you can do with bad translations. Of course. Yeah. I mean, and of course, moving the goalposts isn't unique either, is it? Because we all know that in the assessment of syntactic parsing, um, syntactic parsing seems to have got better partly because in the statistical parsers, they've redefined success not to reach the top node S, but to get so many brackets in the right place and that amazingly changes all the scores just like it does with children's education you know yes. things standards seem to rise everywhere absolutely yes. absolutely yes. yes it's funny you say about you know one of the old jokes in translation used to be that well we don't mean this for poetry you know this isn't for Shakespeare and and recently just for fun at the end of a book of papers I pulled together on my old MT papers I ran a German poem of Rilke's through a Google translator just to see what it did make of poetry. And of course I was being disingenuous. I picked Rilke deliberately because it's such simple German and such simple words. But what came out mysteriously was quite poetic. And I couldn't resist sticking it at the end. Just just for fun. It proves nothing. But I, it just occasionally you can have a good day with Google Translator. That's all I mean. You know. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe maybe if you'd had a, a, a better translation machine you wouldn't have got as good poetry. That could well be true and that might be the right thing to do. Um, Although, of course, you've been in California for a long time, and we discussed you going there to work at RAND. I mean, I know you've kept a watching brief on developments in Europe, and it might just be fun to, if you can, in a few moments, I mean, you were in some sense involved with either the beginning or the m moderating or the reviewing of Vermobile, was that right, yes. and the smart projects? Yeah. What role did you play in that? Well, I suppose quite a considerable role. The, the person from the German ministry who was setting that up came and visited me in California and said, would I be prepared to run what I think they called a feasibility study. So the idea was that we should look into the likelihood of success of a, a project which had the goals of that project, namely to not only produce translation, but translation of spoken conversational dialogue. Um, and I put together a committee of people in the Bay Area um, and we produced a report which uh, somewhat against the wishes of the German minister we actually published as a book um, in which we, uh, we, I think, gave a fairly balanced assessment of the, of the probability of success. We thought it was a worthy thing to do that they should not, their expectations should be, uh, should be modest. Um, and so, okay, so I played that role. Um, then throughout the course of the project, I was a member of the um, committee of so-called Gutachter. I've never found a good translation of that into English, but people who monitor the ongoing progress of the, uh, 
of the uh, of the uh, project, and I went twice a year to their meetings and uh, saw their presentations, and it was very very interesting. I learned a lot. I suppose the word has implications of benevolence or uh, friend of the court. I mean, you're yes, you're not yes. a critic, are you? If you're a right, good actor, right? No, no. I mean, you made me think of another question, and I hardly dare ask, but I can't resist it because it never quite goes away. I mean, I think one of the most extraordinary things about the history of machine translation is the immortality of Sistran under different guises at different times. I mean, we all know it's long before, you know, it was done before your time and before mine. But it's still, as one understands it, embodied in certain web translators like Babel Fiction. Still, for some people, goalposts, being mobile, gives value for money. I mean... I don't know quite what I'm asking. I'm just asking for an off-the-cuff remark. I mean, is that not a remarkable fact that given all the shifts in theory, and now we'll get to it in a moment, statistical methods, this old thing won't go away? Well, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it says a lot about our field, in a sense. I mean, we haven't learnt very much. Uh, possibly, as you say, we'll come to... We might have learnt something recently. We can talk about that. But we haven't learnt very much. Sistran came into being in the late 50s as a result of the, a perceived need in the United States for machine translation in order to learn what the Russians knew about astrophysics that we didn't know and that had enabled them to put up Sputnik. Um, and a lot of people in a lot of places uh, were working on machine translation with this as their primary motivation. Um, I don't think that Sistran was all that different from the rest of them. The basic ideas were the same, but there was a huge amount of determination of various kinds on the part of the person who actually designed Sistran. And they continued to pour into it that one thing that gives it an edge over everybody else, namely vast numbers of special cases, mm. huge vocabularies, huge lists of phrases which are only used once in a blue moon, which, but, but which, by golly, it knows about when it sees them again. And still today, Russian to English machine translation by Sistran is about the best machine translation you can find. Russian to English. Now, Chinese to English, that's something else. But Russian to English, it's magnificent. It's as good as you can get. Well, absolutely. I mean, I you say that because a joke I found myself making in teaching is sometimes that, in some sense, you might say, Sistran was discovering example-based translation as it were, by sheer hard work. I mean, just by making up the examples <laughs> exactly, rather than yes. by formal or sorry about data gathering methods it was just doing yeah. it right extraordinary yeah yes he was doing it in all sorts of senses i had a friend who was um called in to start working on an arabic translation system i wonder why arabic in these times but anyway um he's a native speaker of arabic and he's a phd linguist and those are two things that it's actually rather hard to find together and i asked him after he'd been working on it for a while well so you've been working on uh, Arabic grammar. What is the formalism like that you use? What language do you write in? And the answer is C. It is the basic programming language. That's what is there. It's absolutely, absolutely. Can, can, we, can we stick with Xerox for a second? I mean, it's been mentioned in passing that you spent many years there as a researcher and it overlapped, obviously, in your, in your time as an academic in Stanford next door. But, um, I mean, Xerox has obviously been an extremely interesting company in this field. I mean, you had a long working relationship with Ron Kaplan, who has now spun off into power set, as I understand it, or is now a Microsoft employee. But um, is there something you could say about that without breaching the laws of libel? I mean, in, in the sense that it seems to be generally accepted that Xerox came out with all kinds of wonderful things, hardware, software, but they didn't get out. That was what everybody said. There was, it was a scandal. They were trapped inside, but they weren't exploited either. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, it's, it's, um, it's all true. I mean, it was a small place. At, at, its, at its height, it had 300 people, um, including, you know, everybody, guards and secretaries and everybody. It had 300 people. Um, it did come up with the major ideas for laser printing, 
for um, for it did not come up with the mouse. So I mean, some people want to give us credit for the mouse. No, we did not come up with the mouse. Um, um, most of the displays, windows, and so forth that used it, yes, they came up with all of those ideas. Um, a lot, a lot of what makes the personal computer the personal computer really does come from there. We all had this machine that was made in our lab called the Alto. It had 64,000 bytes of memory, which we thought was huge at the time, and it was indeed the. Um, now, I was not there when this happened, by un but I understand that Steve Jobs came through the lab one day and he saw this machine, and that's why we have the Macintosh today. I believe that story. It sounds entirely pr probable. There was a remarkable manager, a man called Bob Taylor, who ran the computer science department. I have met several other people who have been managers of research departments who have very, very consciously tried to model their style on his because he was able to run things in such a remarkably successful way. A lot of it, however, was luck, as is usually the case in these um, times. When that lab was set up, just two years before I got there, something called the Berkeley Computer Corporation had just folded um, for reasons I don't fully understand, but it was a small corporation with some very brilliant people in them. And Bob Taylor simply hired the lot and brought them to Palo Alto, and they were brilliant. But much of the success doesn't lie, cannot unfortunately be attributed to his management style or to their brilliance, but to the fact that this happened just at the right moment. Com computer science computing was just ready for what they did, and they came just at the right moment. Now, the other side of the coin is that um, Xerox had not the slightest idea what to do with any of this. And I suppose that is not surprising. The people in Xerox sold things that you put in boxes. You sold them a box of stuff. And they couldn't understand the notion of selling systems, things that were more evanescent than, than you could put in a box. And they never did catch the idea and don't think they have it today. Um, and that was where the disconnect. I, Xerox... Um, um, by all, by all reason, um, Apple ought to be a division of Xerox today, but mm -hmm. it's not. That's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it's, in some ways, it's a transition that IBM seems to have made more gracefully. They don't sell many computers anymore. But, 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 they sell kick, services. but kicking and screaming, nevertheless. Kicking and screaming. Yeah. Very difficult periods in between, we assume. Heads must have rolled. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. Um, can we... Uh, well, we're approaching a sort of... Um, trying to tap your views on what is now the dominant paradigm in computational linguistics, statistical methods. We all know that the major things we've talked about from morphology to chart parsing to, to unification have all been symbolic systems of great power. And we all know that following Fred Jelinek and Ken Church about 1990, a, a tsunami overtook the field. And uh, you know, and now it's hard, to, in many conferences, it's hard to publish papers that don't have either statistical methods or evaluation methodologies based on statistics. And um, I don't know, I'd like to know your own view on that in general and in particular. I mean, it, it, you can't argue against history and life and the universe. I mean, it's there. One can't just say we don't like it. I don't know what your view is. I mean, how, how do you view it all? Well, um, I suppose, let me start at the end. Um, I, think, I think that everything that's happened here has been good. And I already see the signs of the way I think it's going to play out, namely that the old fogies like me who, um, who are associated with what they call rule-driven systems and the statistical people, 10 years from now, will be all together in the same sandbox working, working very happily together. I already see this convergence mm -hmm. taking place. Um, I see extraordinary things in the meantime. So I see, for example, not only um, that uh, um, Fred Jelinek and like have sort of um, gone off, have decided, I think, that we've waited for you people in linguistics long enough. 
you've been at this for 50 years, you haven't come up in it with anything that works, we're going off our own way and we're going to get it right. And in a sense that was the right thing to do because the linguists were always saying, as I have said many times, look, we are getting the linguistics right. These grammars that we write are good. These algorithms that we're using, it's just that. Um, these problems, like machine translation, are not purely linguistic problems. In fact, they're not even largely linguistic problems. They're problems of AI. They're problems of understanding the world. Um, and we that's not our job. That's the job of people in AI. So I'm sorry. When they are ready, we will be ready. And quite rightly, people said, well, I don't care who it is we're waiting for. We're not prepared to wait any longer. So they have replaced not only AI, we were happy to, for them to do what they liked with that, but also us with these statistical systems. And interestingly enough, this is reflected back on linguistics. So in my department at Stanford today, you will find a lot of people who you would never have thought would be doing this, not only using computers to discover lots and thousands of examples of things which show that people do this far more often than they did that, or the things that they said they would never say they actually do say, and that uh, using people as um, informants is a very risky and tricky business, perhaps not very valuable at all, all of that. It also leads to extraordinary things. So, for example, somebody in my own department who shall remain nameless um, wrote a paper recently um, saying that uh, maybe some of these phenomena um, are not based on linguistic principles but on statistics, as though somehow statistics was its own sort of fount of um, variability and something to which you could appeal to independently of anything else as explaining something. I take the view that you use statistics in order to get on with something, parts of which you are very ignorant about but want to get on with anyway. You would like, in the end as a scientist, you want to explain the things that give rise to those statistics. They tell me that in quantum mechanics that it's, there are places where you can't do this. You meet statistics head on and there's no place beyond this. But in linguistics and in AI, I don't believe that's true. Um, so what the statistics has done is it has provided us with a way of covering our ignorance, which for a while and to an extent can be very successful. But the fact is, the fact remains that linguistics is recursive. There is a notion of locality, which is not a question of how close things are to one another in a string, and so forth and so on. And that when you insist on taking these things seriously, you will doubtless keep the statistics, but you will have to bring back most of those notions of grammar and recursion and Morphology is a huge problem. Nobody is trying to do, as far as I know, machine translation of Turkish because every word you see in Turkish is a word you haven't seen before. I overstate it, but I mean basically the morphology is so immensely rich that unless you have a way of taking words apart, you're dead. And in all languages and to some extent that kind of thing is true. Yes, I, I think in the particular case of Turkish, I mean, people like Schutz have talked about this, haven't they? I mean, you don't have to work at the level of words with spaces in between. I mean, you can work at another level and then you can bring the, the methods back to apply. But I take your point. I mean, if you take it as words, then they're all new. That's right. Right. Of course, of course. Yes. Yes, but, yes. But as soon as you take the words apart, then, you know, you, you, you're, you are using some of this old stuff. Of I course, mean, we, we, are, we are into taking words apart where I come from. That's yes. something that we do happily. Absolutely. And if you remember, of course, in, in Jelinek's own original French-English, English-French system, there was a morphological component in it, which was, in a sense, linguistically based. And he didn't claim he did that by statistical methods. Right. So there was always a slight, a slight sort of trapdoor or worm at the centre of the thing. But I mean, I don't think it invalidated what he did, but it, it was funny that he didn't attempt to do that. Right. French had a morphology and it had to be in there somewhere. So all his 
slagging off of linguists right. and, wasn't and completely serious. Yes, and he, I mean, he has no embarrassment about that. He oh, knows no. that perfectly well, yes. Oh, no. And I think, I mean, he's a good personal friend, as I'm sure he's of yours. And what I think is so wonderful about Jelinek is that having built that pure statistics system, which, let's face it, I mean, you know, didn't do all that well. It was just shocking it did as well as it did. He then, of course, moved over to another situ another position, which I think is his current position, which is that um, all he means is now is that linguistic structures should be derived by empirical methods. It could be grammars, it could be lexicons, it could be any structures you wish. I mean, in a sense, uh, it's quite obvious to me now that Jel uh, Jelinek has no prejudice against linguistic structures at all. He just wants right. them to be empirically based, and it doesn't seem to me any sane person can argue against that. Well, it depends what you mean by empirical. Um, what it means to a lot of people is that you should discover what you know about language through looking at examples of language. Hmm. So, but um, in the extreme case, you know, if Champollion had had only Egyptian hieroglyphs and no Greek, mm -hmm. we would be just as innocent of what those hieroglyphs mean today as we were then. Um, you cannot discover very much at all. You can actually perhaps discover some grammatical things about a totally unknown language just by looking at text in it, but figuring out what it means mm. and what those words are referring to, you have no chance. Yeah. So, but with translation, you do have a chance because you can see correlations, mm. which are very important. Look at, look at what Google is doing today. But can you get it all that way? And is that what it means to be empirical? Um, mm. I, am I am personally quite convinced that you can only get an, a relatively small glimmering of what you need to do in, in of, of what it is a translator knows that makes them able to translate by looking at texts. And I'm interested, I was re reflecting recently on how much actual translation a professional translator has probably looked at by the time they get their degree in translation. And I suppose it could be couple of hundred thousand words, it's not that much. I mean, what they know that makes them good at the job doesn't come from looking at translations. No. No. And I think, I think that's an important point. I think it's crucial. I mean, I, I know a speech version of that, not because I'm a speech person, but my speech colleagues say it, that sort of, if a baby learnt to speak the way that um, the statistical basis of speech recognition systems work, it would take a baby a hundred years to learn to speak. So they can't. I mean, it's <laughs> roughly the same as what you're saying. Yeah. The fact that we learn so much from such little data. Of course, given me Stuart Chomsky used to say something like that, but he, he, he didn't quite know why he was saying it, but he was saying it, wasn't he? I mean, he, it was very much part of his point of view. The data was always insufficient. Yes. Um, yes. My point, I think, um, the conclusion I would draw from that is very different from Chomsky's. I mean, I think that a good translator is somebody who's been around the world a lot, who, um, who's crossed the street without getting run over, and, you know, who knows, uh, who knows the kinds of things that, that the people who are writing this text and trying to understand it know. Somebody who has been s steeped in a pair of languages all their life, if they're confronted with something on a subject they know nothing about, they can't translate it. I mean, it, knowing the language is not, is not the key thing at all. And of course, people who speak several languages know quite different things in different languages, don't they? Right. Some people can only discuss linguistics in this language and that language. They can only order kitchen food and do cooking in that language. I mean, it's quite yes. normal, isn't it? It's quite normal, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. Somewhere when discussing this, I saw recently you refer to, um, it's in your ACL lecture again, I think, you refer to emergent properties of language. I mean, you know, that's a word with a long history, but I mean, is that, did you mean something that sort of um, rule or declarative like facts could emerge from statistical generalizations? I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I wonder if you remember what you yeah, meant when no, you referred I, to it. No, I know exactly what I meant. Um, the question that I was c confronting was, is it the case even in principle that if you could have as much parallel text as you liked, you would be able to discover what you need to know in order to produce a machine translation system. Is the information somehow there in those texts? Mm. And I believe it's not. Mm. Artificial intelligence people would agree with you, but from a different point of view, wouldn't they? I mean, they'd take the view that it's all knowledge of the world, and that's where they're almost Gibsonians. Our knowledge is of the world and in the world. Mm -hmm. 
but it comes, it's a different form of explaining the same phenomenon, that the surface of the text just doesn't contain sufficient information. No, and there's no reason to, to expect that it should, no, really. No, no, I mean, no. Yeah. no, no. Uh, Martin, in, in conclusion, could we just uh, turn to something that's not essentially linguistic but more social? I mean, you've been for about a quarter of a century the president of the International Committee on Computational Linguistics, following Bernard Vauquois and Dave Hayes, I think, who founded it. And of course, I'm a member of it myself, so of course I admire it and I admire what you've done. It, it's a very different sort of association from other, shall we say, societies in the business with little constitution and uh, mm -hmm. relaxed attitude to raising funds and so on, but it has, does run very splendid conferences. I mean, do you, do you see that going on? I mean, do you, I hope you'll say yes. You see Coling conferences and ICCLs continuing to have a role because you've been identified with it for so long. Well, I've, I've always, you know, there have been times when respectable organizations of a standard kind, like the Association for Computational Linguistics, have said that they thought it was time that we should allow them to take us over. And uh, we have generally resisted this, um, but my point of view has generally been um, that uh, you know if people continue to increase the numbers of people at their conferences while they decrease the number of people at ours, at ours, then we will go away gracefully in due course. That has not happened. No. So I think one of the things um, about coaling is that it is, for better or for worse, it's a very conservative sort of institution. We do not try, we do not normally subscribe to the low, to climbing on the local bandwagon or the particular fashion that happens to be around at the moment. In fact, we fight it a little bit. If we see something coming to dominate in the programs, we try to push, we try to find somebody on the program committee who will, who will provide a counterweight to that. Um, so, uh, as things stand at the moment, I see us in fairly healthy shape and going on that way for probably longer than I will be able to witness. You're right. I mean, I just remembered while you were talking, of course, many people seeing this won't know this, that when Dave Hayes set it up, it was initially to make a sort of bridge across to Eastern European countries and linguists in the Cold War, wasn't it? And of course, it's, yes. it's spread out to be completely worldwide now with big Japanese representation, but worldwide membership was always a strong motivation, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and throughout a lot of that early period, the Association for Computational Linguistics was very double-minded about the extent to which it was really an American um, institution and to the extent to which it was really international. Um, there was talk about whether we, there should, the ACL should always have its meetings in America, but that there should be... Uh, there should be uh, satellite groups in other places and so on. Now they've settled all that, but, mm. um, but for a long period, the only really international conferences in our field were the, were the coaling conferences. So now we have two sort of international titans sort of battling it out, and the market, as you, as you describe it, will decide. Well, I don't think that there, there isn't much of a battle. We have met two or three times now and had our conferences mm -hmm. together, and those have been some of the best conferences by everybody's accounting mm -hmm. that, that there have been. So I, I think we live fairly amicably together. Um, we keep on saying that we're going to actually coordinate, that we're going to exchange information on when and, when and where our conferences are going to be so that we can uh, arrange things in a better way. And I still think that would be a good thing to do, but we never quite managed to do it. No, it's a sort of semi anschluss no total anschluss. <laughs> right. No, no, of yes. course. Well, Martin, thank you so much. I, I've gained a lot from that, and I hope people will enjoy watching this. And thank you very much for talking about your life and work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it.